Well, I have to say, of all the places I've recorded, this is just about the most beautiful. I could just live here. So what I want to talk to you about is um, the different classifications of markup languages, and I call this a taxonomy of markup languages, using that word taxonomy in the sense of a classification or a way to fit every, cat every, um, every kind of markup into a set of categories. In fact, the way I've defined it, it may more be uh, it may be closer to the idea of a faceted classification of, of markup languages, but so be it. Well, the first, the first um, category, the first um, distinction that I'd like to make is between open and closed, so to speak, markup languages. Open ones that use an open format and closed ones that use a binary format. A binary format simply means a format that, most, um, that you need to be the creator of the format in order to read. All formats are binary formats in the sense that they're stored inside computers and everything stored inside of a computer is binary. But a binary format generally refers to one that's proprietary, one that you can't open up, say, in, in Notepad or you can't read without, um, without the permission or the instructions of the creator. So word processing format, for example, is binary. And one of, the, um, one of the advantages of a binary format is because it's not an open standard and it doesn't have to obey everyone's rules, it can be very compact, it can be very efficient, and it can use very, very little um, storage in order to create markup. So you can imagine if you were creating a binary markup that only you could read, then you could be really parsimonious and you could create a very efficient markup. And um, uh, an indication of this is when you store, for example, a Microsoft Word file in the binary format and then store it in an open format, like it has an XML format or an RTF format, and you'll see the file size gets way bigger because it's, lay, it's way less efficient to, to store this content in this verbose, um, non-binary format. Okay, so what's the, what's the opposing is an open format, and the open format these days is called Unicode. But let me give you a quick kind of history of this idea of Unicode. Unicode, before it was Unicode, the open standard was called ASCII. Um, and ASCII has a sort of, uh, <laughs> a not such a bright history, and it starts with, um, with uh, some computer scientists saying, okay, what is it going to take to represent all the characters that someone might type into a computer? Um, how are we going to go about representing them? Well, of course, everything is a binary code. Not to be confused with this idea of binary, um, a binary format, everything is a code, but we're going to make an open standard for what those codes are, so anybody can read and anybody can write the characters that, are in a, that, that people use in computers. Um, and, uh, and the next question came up, well, how much room is it going to take? How much storage do we need in order to, um, in order to store all these characters? And they thought, well, Let's see, there's 26 letters, you know, a um, uh, few dozen punctuation marks. We have the numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, zero. We have some currency symbols, you know, all together, you know. Oh, let's say around about 80, 90, you know, different ones ought to do it. 80 or 90 different ones. And what does that mean? That means 80 or 90 distinct binary codes in order to represent, quote unquote, all the characters. 80 or 90 binary codes, that, that equals one what's called a byte. One byte can store 256 different combinations, and because of peculiarities of the way that, the, that, that those codes are stored, they could only use seven bits out of, those, out of that eight-bit byte. A byte is eight bits. Eight bits can store two to the eighth or 256 different character combinations. And because of some peculiarities, as I said, that, that they could only use seven of those bits, and so, um, the, the, the seven bits yielded 127 characters, and 127 characters is sure a lot more than 80 or 90, and it even gave a little room for expansion, right? So the result of that was an encoding system called ASCII, and ASCII, which uses eight bits or one byte of computer storage in order to store a character, and it can store a whopping 127 different kinds of characters. Well, I think you know where the story is going. Is there really only 127 different kinds of characters that someone might want to have inside of a computer? Well, only if you live in California and you don't know any other languages is that true, right? But in reality, in the real world, there's all sorts of characters. There's, there's all sorts of scripts. There's all sorts of different variations, and 127 isn't just, it just isn't going to cut it. So along came the idea of Unicode, Unicode being a, uni a unitary coding of any character that can be typed. And they decided at first that they were going to use two bytes. So that was not one, not eight bits, not eight bits, but 16 bits, and that's two to the 16th. I think that's uh, 43,000 or something like that. Don't quote me on that, I don't have a calculator in front of me, but it's, it's a lot, and it seemed sufficient to represent the world's languages. 
And then they said, you know what? We don't have to scrimp on memory. Let's make Unicode four bytes. That's eight, 16, 32 bits. 32 bits can, can yield, uh, what is it? 4.3 billion different combinations. 4.3 billion ought to be enough to, ca to cover all of, the, all of the characters that we're ever gonna come up with. And, they, and it was kind of like the year 2K problem, right? Where before the year 2K, they were all worried about how, well, how much it was gonna take to store the year. And after the year 2K problem, we're, we've gotten over this, uh, this, this idea that storage is really uh, expensive and we should economize all the time on storage. And now we just make an ample amount of storage to store dates and we'll never, we'll never run out. Same thing with Unicode. It's a lot like ASCII in the sense that it represents characters, any character you type, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, but also any Chinese character, any Indonesian character, any um, Thai character, any Vietnamese character, on and on, all the different character sets across the entire world. And, it, and um, there are now inside of Unicode, there are, various, um, there are various slices of Unicode. The one that we'll talk about and the one we'll work with most is called UTF-8. UTF-8 was designed specifically so that the very first eight bits, the very first byte is also ASCII, so it's backwards compatible. And most, most browsers and most um, uh, things that work with text really work on the UTF format. All right, that's ASCII versus binary. Binary means it's in a proprietary format. Um, sorry, op open or Unicode means that it's in a non-proprietary format. Anybody can see it, anybody can work with it. And the common one today is UTF, and we'll be working with UTF-8. Don't get confused, UTF-8 still means that it's uh, that it's 32 bits. I don't, I don't even remember why they call it eight. 